that's a good thing. okay gentlemen best behavior you're being recorded big brother is watching you <laughs> i actually signed into uh, mr flippant's global zoom meeting and there were people from the uk there was a guy from australia that sounds like the beginning of a limerick um, but <laughs> But I couldn't stick around the whole time so that because everybody was just, you had them go around the room and tell about themselves. So that took some time. Oh. <laughs> it's kind of like an AA meeting. Yeah, what was the purpose, <laughs> what was yeah, the purpose I, of it, Alwyn? <clears throat> eh? What was the purpose of that meeting, Zoom? Uh, same as our Friday evening meeting. Oh, okay. Talk. <laughs> It's uh, the purpose of the meeting is there is no purpose. Okay. It's just socialize and what have you. He's got a lot of interesting posts on uh, the uh, slot forum there. Uh, along with slot crazy too. I've been reading a lot of them. Um, Larry, we are seeing your forehead and that's about it. My forehead? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Yes. You either got to stand up or you got to move your camera. <laughs> Light above you is like the sun shining off your head, bro. <laughs> yeah, it was glaringly obvious that it was too high. <laughs> okay. But on reflection, I think you've got it right now. Yeah. You got it okay? Yes. Oh, uh, good, good, uh, good call on the uh, the committee meeting today, guys. Yeah, that was good. Fully support your decision. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks very much, guys. It's. Uh, it's not a fun one to take because we all want to, we all want to play. It's yeah. as simple as that. But well, on that note, my track will be open, reopening in about two weeks. Good stuff. <laughs> what all have you done on yours, Perry? Uh, just repainted uh, new copper. Uh, gone to oh, copper. Repainted, repainted the, the running surface too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gone to colors, lane identification is colors now. Um, cool. Just to start installing the new timing system today. Yeah, okay. I, and I think we'll we'll be getting a new uh, rule for membership. Um, colorblind people are not allowed to join. <laughs> yeah, that that could be a problem. Especially you got a, the blue lane and the green lane are right beside each other. So uh oh, could be. A Isn't that discrimination? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> So, Owen, is that uh, your car is sitting on what, 1970 Shag or something? Uh, what is that? <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> it's more of an 80s vintage. It's just a piece of toweling. I just wanted yeah, maybe. I'm on white paper, but then you could see nothing because it's uh, of the glare. It was worse than Larry's forehead. <laughs> oh, don't! <laughs> What I thought last last uh, week, he was lying on the living room floor having a meeting. <laughs> Who was? Alwyn. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, it looks like we I'm have. I'm just kidding, Owen. Yes, your, sir. Uh, the the videos that you've been putting up there. Um, there's no centralized um, way to access it. Unless you've got the the link from the uh, from the tuning session. No, what I'll do in the meantime, when I get to it, I'll create a um, a collection. Then you know it'll all be under one collection. You can click on the collection, and all the stuff that's uh, related to it will come up. But at the moment, there's only one video, so uh, a one video collection is not very exciting. Yeah, but no, but uh, this one like is I was up. trying to. I just went on to YouTube and I put in uh, root C tuning or, or Alwyn Slabbard or... If you put in GVSCC, you'll see it as part of a number of uh, videos out there. Uh -huh. okay. If you subscribe to Alwyn's channel as well, it'll let you know. Yeah, hit the subscribe okay. button. Yeah, hit the subscribe button. Shame <laughs> your plug for you, Alwyn. <laughs> Unsubscribe. <laughs> yeah, so it goes. Right. Okay, guys, I, I think we have whoever we will be having for now. So uh, this evening is likely to be a bit shorter than, than before uh, because there's a little bit less to it. 
So just to, to recap, what we're looking at this evening is sort of putting the car together as the, the final thing before taking it to the track and uh, the moment of truth as to how well or how badly it, it runs. So very briefly, we took a look at the chassis, we flattened it, we took a look at the pod, we might have flattened it, but really not. We took a look at the pod clearance, we scraped the pod in the chassis to make sure there's decent float without a six millimeter gap between the two. As, where's John this evening? Right here. Uh, sorry, not John, Jamie. Yeah. Uh, because Jamie had about a half inch gap between the, the pod and the chassis. Um, so also then the chassis to body clearance for float, we installed the motor, we glued it, we screwed it. Uh, the rear tires, we glued and trued, the front tires, we profiled and trued, we've done the guide and braid, we've done the initial front axle set up. Set up. So now we pretty much have all the, the, the components ready to put together in a somewhat hopefully working car. The first thing to do is uh, to get back to, and I'll pin my own tail on my donkey so that I can see what you see as well. Um, So the first thing we want to do is, is to, to get the initial pod uh, degree of float that, that we want to have as a starting position. Now, we were supposed to do that last week, um, but just a reminder, where do we start? I would, I would suggest that as a starting position, you have the, the, the rear pod screws loosened by about one turn and the fronts half to three quarters in, in that kind of range. So I mean this is this is really not rocket science guys. So you just tighten it till the screw bottoms. Don't you're all familiar with the engineering concept how to torque a screw you tighten it until you strip the threads and then you back it off a quarter turn. Nice. No, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> so you just lightly, it's plastic guys, until it bottoms and then you loosen it one turn. And the same on the other side, half and one. And I will on the front, I will do so you three. So this is half. This is three quarters. Why the difference, Owen? Front and rear? Yeah. Uh, 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 <laughs> I generally find that after I tune up the car, the front is slightly tighter than the rear, Ross. Um, but it's important to remember that this really is only a, a, an initial starting point. So really, whether you have it at one or a half, it really doesn't matter. So here we have a half and three quarter. Okay. So this you're now be sitting. Oh. Very quiet. The way that it, that it should sit. Um, and you should have nice and, and free movement because you did a good job of, uh, of doing the clearance in, in that during that first workshop. The next thing uh, that we should do is to, uh, for me not to go to the wrong place first. So the next thing is taping the pod. So the question is that we'll take a look at what, what tape do you use? How much tape do you put on? And where do you put on? Um, you, the answers are, do you use good tape? You use just enough and you put it exactly in the right place. Are we okay there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So we'll go back. I've bought online some 3M reinforced. You have to use reinforced um, packing tape. And I prefer the packing tape that has the, 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 the um, reinforcement running in, in both uh, lengthwise and crosswise. Uh, I will send to you afterwards the, the product number if you're interested, but you can typically find uh, reinforced packing tape at, at places like Canadian Tire and sometimes even at um, your Canada Post outlet. Staples has it as well. Hey, Marie. That's easy. <clears throat> okay, so applying the tape. Oh, I see mine is somewhat oddball. Guys, again, this is going to be a matter of you will be doing some trial and trialing and erroring on, on your tuning. But as a starting position. Um, I typically, I run it crosswise across this section of the chassis. So what I would do, I would just line it up with, uh, now I'd have to move my head in front of the light if I'm not careful. I just line it up with the, the uh, the wheel openings at the back there and stick it across. And just make sure that it sits down properly. And then you get out your trusty X-Acto knife. You all have X-Acto knives, I take it. And you want to trim the side so it's just inside the edge of the uh, of the chassis. That's outside. Don't cut a piece off your chassis. Don't cut that arm. So don't use an angle grinder for this. Owen, can you uh, tell us what the tape does in terms of uh, chassis function? Aha. Uh -huh. um, the reason for the tape is that you want to have some pod movement relative to the chassis to take up vibration and irregularities on the track and uh, cornering, etc. cetera. Uh, but you don't want it to be the movement to be uncontrolled. Uh, you can't just, it's like, uh, it serves similar ser purpose to the damper on your car suspension. In other words, it allows the movement, but it controls so that it doesn't, uh, that it doesn't just flop around. So it dampens it so that, that it's, you don't get harsh movements because harsh movements upsets the, 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 uh, the car as it changed, you know, it's sort of, wham over to the one side and when it moves that quickly uh when it hits the, the stops as it were uh you can get the car losing grip that that kind of thing so all that it does it allows you to to have that the, the chassis and body moving relative to the pod and remember the wheels are attached to the pod so the pod you want these wheels to sit flat on the track you want the pod to stay flat uh, but you want the, any movement uh, the, to control the amount of movement of the, the chassis and then the body. Does that make sense? Like a shock absorber. Like a triage. Yeah, it's, it's essentially a, a damper or a shock absorber, whatever you're used to calling it. Um, what you need to make sure is... You can either cut it straight with the front edge of the pod, or you can leave it beyond, but then you'll have to cut open the, the, the screw heads because the screws screws screw solidly into the pod. So if you've got the tape over the head, that, that restricts the movement too much. 
So I'm going to take the easy way out this evening and just run it all the way across like this. There, isn't that pretty? Very nice. Mm -hmm. So that is the kind of, of uh, placement. And guys, the question on how much is this is a, a good place to start. Uh, when you start tuning the car, you could end up cutting it over here and removing the front piece, cutting it over here, removing the back piece, you know, cutting piece of it off, running the car, seeing, see what the behavior is like. You can add some more over to the back, but that's very difficult to, to control properly. I typically wouldn't bother about that, but you can increase the coverage or reduce the coverage when you start testing the car. Again, this is only a starting point. And remember when I said when we had to do the, the size of the tires, you need to make sure that you still have your millimeter plus gap between the tape and the, uh, and the track. I have a question, Ola. Yes, sir. Uh, before applying the tape, you, you backed off their screws. Yes. Um, is there any, would it be any difference, because I've heard other people do this, applying the tape with the screws tight? I don't think it matters much one way or the other, Perry. Whatever okay. floats your boat. Whatever floats your boat. I, I really don't see that, that there's much different in the order in which you do it, I don't think is going to affect any much of anything. I guess the reason I was given is that uh, with the screws tight, your pod will be position centered. It'll be where it should be before you apply the tape. That is a valid comment. Maybe that's why my cars are performing so poorly these days. <laughs> um, what do you have to, sorry? Sir, I was gonna say, did that come from Chris by chance? Are you asking Perry? Oh, I'm not revealing my sources. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that's why it's called a workshop and not a class, because you guys have got to uh, need to give input as well. So Perry, yeah, in all, in all probability, that's probably the better way to go. I've gotten into the habit of doing it this way, but it's probably a bad habit. Okay, so the next thing we will take a look at is um, routing the wires. The beauty, one of the beauties of, of Slotted is that they, they build in these lovely little uh, lead wire holders on their, on their chassis. What we need to do is to make sure that we've got the right amount of movement and get them in the right place. Remember guys, if, if you've taken the, the lead wires off, um, remember that there's a little gap over here that the wire, there's a, a channel under the axle here that the, the wire has to go through to make sure that it doesn't foul the axle at any stage. So what you want to end up with is the wires going sideways like this so that you've got enough space to to freely move it mustn't you know it should be able to turn all the way without snagging so what i've got here is a little bit too little so i'll add a little bit there and then i'll start pushing it in these little little holders on the side here And for this, you need decent fingernails. And if you do it right, then you've nailed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here you can see it, it's free to turn all the way 
and it, there's still a, a little bit of free, free play, which is one less than four play. So you're trying to get them so that they look, they have the same amount of, of uh, play and the same tension at the end. Because what that will do, it will help you with centering the guide. Um, if you know that that once in, in every six months that, that you de-slot, it just makes marshalling easier. So what you're looking for is something like that. If you now take a look, because you've got the wires held in properly, you've got the right amount of equal play on both sides. The, the, the guide should be, you know, it, it, won't, it won't go dead straight. I mean, that, that's expecting too much. But if you, if you pick it up, it'll end up close to, to straight. And that makes marshalling a thousand times easier. You know, marshalling it with, with an offset like that, not that difficult. Marshalling, if it's jammed over like this, real pain in the ass, because now the marshal has to pick it up and take a look where the guide is, center it, and then, then re-slot re the car. Thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. Um, I find that if you use the slotted wire and you push them in these little little holders over here, there's no need to add glue or anything like that. Um, if you have extraordinarily long wires, which normally doesn't happen with a stock slotted, you just has to, have to make sure that this is not binding anywhere. This little bit of a, there's always a little bit of a, a loop at the, at the back here. So just make sure that that's not binding with the interior or, or anything like that. Make sure it sits flush next to the motor. All righty then. Ha. Huh. Next thing, weight. And when you talk about weight, the question obviously is how much and where? Wait a minute, Owen. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. Just wait. Okay. Okay, uh -oh. I'm weightless. <laughs> Weigh it. <laughs> uh, the question always is on, on the weight, how much to use and where are you supposed to? Um, There's, there is a theory that says if you put weight low down, the car tends to slide. If you put it high up, the car tends to, to, uh, to get more grip. I've got to tell you, I've done this many times and I don't really see that. I just, I'm not a great fan of weight higher up. I mean, can you experiment with weight higher up? And when I say higher up, the, the two places typically that you can put it is along the sides of the motor here and inside the body. But I'm not mad keen uh, on that. Do you have to add weight right from the get-go? Uh, the answer is oh huh? no give it a try yes that's that's fair comment um i've reached the stage ross where i just a, a, a stock slotted car <clears throat> like this um without any weight added is just a little bit too twitchy for me. By all means, uh, your, your starting weight position and amount can be no weight, nowhere. I've 
found a good starting point to be, uh, let me just get one of these weights out. Could you just wait a moment more after Perry's? You've seen these little wheel weights? No. <clears throat> they tend to fit in very nicely over here. It looks like they were designed for it. So I would typically start off either with, with five, seven grams over here, or some weight over here, underneath here. With a sidewinder, it's, it's very different. The, the inline, uh, the sidewinder has the weight very much um, sort of biased towards the rear. With sidewinders, I definitely put some weight inside the pod on the front of the pod. Uh, with the inlines, uh, this is a good place to start. This is a good thing to try, you know, under there, but just make sure that it doesn't foul the motor shaft. Um, so as a starting point, I would, with, with the Group C cars, I would probably start with some weight over here. And then when you take it to the track, you take some self-adhesive weights and you can start experimenting to see what it does. Um, you can put weight over here, over here. You can put it on the side of the motor. You can put it under the motor. If you're getting some, some very strange behaviors with, uh, with the front lifting out, you can put some even under the axle between the, the uh, body mount and, and the guide in that pocket over there. I've seen some weight added over here on some very fast cars. Not a ton of weight. Over here, you would have like half a gram or something like that. Um, we were also talking about last week as to what, what weight should you use. And now what the hell did I do with all my weights? Guys, I've lost weight without even a diet. Glad to hear that, Ola. Do any of you guys have a good source of where to get those weights that are used on wheels? <laughs> I just bought some. <laughs> I, I just bought some, Tim. Where do you get those? I got them from, uh, I forget the guy that was here last week or the week before. Anyway, um, Lord Co. Okay. You get them in a strip, I think it was 24, and they're like three bucks and a little bit for one strip. So I got a couple of strips, it was six dollars total. Great, yeah, great. I'll probably get them too because he works at the dealership. Your local, your local friendly tire store, he'll give you a few. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Hey, Ross, you got a couple of strips. That means you got a stripper, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Got it cheap, too. I did, too. Six, six bucks, yeah. Yep. Is yeah, all well, that was for the lead. A couple of bucks for the stripper. Where did Owen go? The teacher left the room. Hey? Uh, in, in embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were waiting around. <laughs> yeah. NSR makes some weights that, that look like this. They're got an adhesive backing. You get them in different uh, thicknesses. This is two millimeters. This is thick. You need very little of this uh, to, to, get, to get weight. They have them in one millimeter and something else. I can't remember the exact. Uh, so that's the, the two options. The two best options and easiest would be Yes, your friendly neighborhood tire uh, supplier and fitment center, uh, or you can buy it from, from most uh, slot car. Most slot car places would, would have either NSR or Professor Motor is the other one that, that sells good self-adhesive uh, different thickness lead. 
And what's the typical amount of weight that you're adding? This is seven grams. Okay. Those are the weights, Tim, they come in seven gram pieces. Yeah, because okay. that's a quarter of an ounce. So, yeah, so that's a hangover of... from the imperial system. Yes, in it. Yeah. So it's a quarter ounce and then you get half an ounce, which is 14 grams. Um, if, what I've got here are the, the new lead-free, like steel uh, weights. They're just about bloody impossible to cut. They are. Um, so if you want to cut the weights, you're better off with lead. Um, and you can also get all kinds of interesting diseases from that. So it makes it very exciting. You can hacksaw those steel uh, aluminum weights too, as well. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I have like, I have access to tons of that stuff. If anybody wants that, I don't know if you want lead or if you want the steel ones, but I can get you the steel ones. The stuff from Lordco is that lead? Yeah, it was lead. Okay. Oh, you get easy. You can also flatten that too. So. Yeah. That's surprising with the uh, the paranoia about the dangers of of lead. I I surprised that they actually still tell them but hey. um i have a question about are we done with weight yet uh yeah that's pretty much it guys so the, the okay Mary, all that i wanted to do is you can sorry i wanted to go ahead and say or ask what you wanted to ask or say okay so other than the placement of the weight do you find there's any advantage or disadvantage of applying weight to the chassis as opposed to the actual pod? Uh, interesting. Uh, Chris Walker is, is uh, one of the, the more noted slot car chassis builders. Um, and uh, he's, he's very well known for building exceptional scratch built chassis, but also doing very good proxy cars using regular components. Uh, he's commented to me at one stage, why the hell would you put it on the chassis? Um, he believes it, it pretty much has to be on the pod because that is what, what drives, you know, the, the weight and, and the... Uh, I firmly believe that there's, there's, this is a good place for weight. This is a good place for weight. This is a good place. So you have one person that says it has to be on, on the pod. I've taken a look at, at a lot of good proxy cars. Virtually all of them would have some weight on the chassis. You, no ifs, buts, or maybes. There will be weight on the chassis of a plastic car. A good, well-prepared, successful proxy car. Um, in terms of the, the other question about the, the amount and, and where, et cetera, you won't find any proof that says your car has to weigh X grams and it will be good. But a good rule of thumb to start is around 85 grams. Have a look in the garage on the table. Uh, and if you take a look at, at some of the new- I'll be right down. The new high performance ready to I'll run. Tell you when I get there. Like NSR and uh, and slaughtered. You know, some of the four GTs, etc., they, they're like less than 70 grams. They are very light. And when you drive them, you feel it. They are very twitchy. Yes, they're very responsive to the throttle. They're very, you know, they accelerate brilliantly. Um, but you you need to be so careful when you're going around the corners because the smallest movement of, of the throttle tends to get a, a big uh, reaction from the car. So a good starting point is, is around 85 grams. How should it be weighted? Um, do another, an important piece of equipment. Does anybody have anything like this? I don't. Yes. A little $5 digital scale. I've got two. Uh, $10 digital scales. 
again, Voice the fun. Again, it's, uh, is this an, an absolute? No, it's not an absolute, but the general rule of thumb is 60, 40. 60% 60 of the weight on the back, 40% of the weight on the front. Again, guys, um, what we're talking about, these are general accepted principles of, of tuning, and this serves as a starting point. So take a look at it. So try and end up with your car a little bit over 80 grams, 80, so 80 to 85 grams somewhere, or 78 to 85 grams, something like that. Um, but preferably a little bit over 80 grams and 60% of the weight on the back and 40% on the front. I'm waiting for a question about this. Yeah, you're going to show us how you weight, uh, measure. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to ask that. Did I say that? Why did I make such a... No, but you were thinking it. Oh, shit. I mean, agree. <laughs> you're better off if you have two scales, as, uh, as Perry has. Um, because what you need to do when you weigh the car, the car has to be perfectly flat or flat horizontal, not flat. You're not smashing it. It has to sit perfectly horizontal because if you weigh it, and I'm exaggerating like this, you find that there's weight transference to the rear. So it will weigh, say, 65, 35. If you weigh it like this, and I'm talking about the exact same car, you'd find it 58, uh, 42 kind of thing. Um, it's a struggle. I personally struggle with it because the other question that I have is, uh, where do you have to weigh the front end to get the, the, the 40? Remember what we've said, front tires barely touching. So really at rest, it almost is not taking any weight, which to me imp implies 60, 40. Comments? No, that makes sense. But then the question, of course, is, well, the best way that I think then is to, to make sure that your front tires are, are not resting on anything. Rest it on, on, the, on the, the guide the way that it would normally sit. Because also what you need to be careful of is that when you weigh it, you don't weigh it um, so that it sits up. Uh, on the front end of the guide, it also mustn't sit on the back end of the guide. Do you get what I'm saying? Because that that is a very different weight point, and it will quite significantly influence the the, uh, the distribution that you get. So what you need to do is, I typically shim up. <laughs> I would put the the scale, the back of the car on it. And then you have to support it in some way, shape or form so that it sits exactly level and it's taking the weight exactly on the, uh, on the braids, not the tires. So you have to, to have, it's impossible to do it on something like this. It has to be a, a hard, flat surface like wood or, or whatever. And then you make sure that now the chassis here is perfectly horizontal level and it sits like this. And then you take the weight reading at the back. And really, if you think of it, if you have the front set up properly like this with the back over there, you only have to weigh the back of the car and get and the total weight because the rest is being carried the way that you have it up front here. So do you recommend it to actually use it in a like a put the slot into a, a slot on your on your board and lift it up and so you're resting on the braids only? 
That's what I believe. Okay. Alwyn, do you normally test your weight with the car body on it or just chassis? Oh yeah, it, it is complete. Okay. It is, the 85 grams is the complete car. Everything, yeah. the way that you would take it to the track and put it on the track and race it. And the weight distribution is the way that the car is set up, you know, with a body, everything included, sitting the way that it would sit on the track. So yeah, it should be like this. And uh, your body screws would be in their right place as well, not on the ass end of the car. <laughs> and then you'd have the back wheels on the, and the front end suspended on the braids, not the front tires, and sitting perfectly level. And once you've done that perfectly, you take the car to the track and you screw around with the weight and everything changes. So how exact do you have to be on this? Guys, it's a guideline. It really is, do I bust a gut on this? No, if I get it somewhere like on the back tires, it's somewhere between 55 and 65%. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, if it's like 50-50, then I'm worried because that that is typically not an area where cars handle well. If it's 80-20, you've got a problem as well. The other thing on weight placement, I would have said that on putting weight a lot of weight over here is not a good idea. And then the guys from Edmonton last year that beat the snot out of us on the, in the TT had weight behind the motor, on the motor, on the sidewinder. So it's like right over the axle. So the problem with these general guidelines that, that I'm mentioning now, is that really their starting point of generally accepted good practices. But at the end of the day, what you have to do is you set the car up to, to the basic norms, you take it to the track, and then you start experimenting with more weight, less weight, forward, backward, sideways, whatever. Does this sound like science? No, it doesn't, because it isn't. And you'll end up different cars wanting more or less weight to different places, two cars that look almost essentially identical, and they'll just behave totally bloody differently. So it makes you wonder why we bother, eh? But the big thing is, if you prepare it with a Group C slaughter, if you put seven grams over here, if you put the tape over here, if you do the other things that I had, you can take it to the track and you will have a well running car. That is unequivocal. Is it a superb, supremely unbeatable car? No. The, to take it from a very good car to a killer car is, you know, going to the track, experimenting with weight, amount of weight placement, pod screw adjustment, body screw adjustment, etc. Where do you start first? Do you start with your pod adjustment or do you play around with weight first? I don't know, Larry. I, well, what, what this, do you do? This is a part that I'm typically not very good at. Um, and this is where I need to get better. Um, I would try and get it as best I can with, with a 60, 40, 85 gram situation. You know, adjusting the pod screws, adjusting the body screws. I will try and get it as smooth and as fast as I can get it. Then I will start taking a look at the behavior of the car and see if I can add some weight at different places and change the, the weight 
and see what it does. Because it, it's going to, the, the good tuners end up with a trial and error. You do the, the, the pod setup, etc., cetera, et cetera, to get it to the best. Then you go and fiddle with the weights and then you go back to changing because now you don't know whether with this weight, it's better um, with this weight, with this pod setup, but now you go back and you start fiddling with the, with the pod again. And, and it's an iterative process. If you, but now you're really talking about getting the very last little bit out of the car. I will, I will guarantee you, if you set up your car at 85 grams, approximately 60, 40, um, with the pod screws, you know, around three quarters of a turn loose back and front, you'll have a good car. You, if you've done everything that, that we've been talking about up to this point, without then doing fine tuning, it'll still be better than just about anybody else's car that, that, that you know, that you find at, at the regular club. I'm not talking <laughs> about good tuners. Is that good enough? Hmm. Good question. But the fiddly bit is, is where you, you get, you know, doing it, setting it up like this, you get the 90% of the benefit or 95% maybe even. But now getting it from 94% to 98% where the, the good proxy guys are, that's where the fiddling comes in. All righty. It's, if I've depressed you, I'm sorry. But at least take comfort that if you just do these things, you will have a very, very good slot car. And let's take a look. What are we looking at next? Okay, now, once you've done that, we'll do uh, a final check on the front axle because you've messed around with the car now just to make, and I'm not going to repeat, we went through setting up the front axle height last week, and you've got the video to refer back to. The next thing is now you've got uh, this. Should be here. Guys, you all lubricate your cars, don't you? This is the place where everybody nods their heads and say yes. Yes. You're a bunch of lying bastards because I've seen your cars. Virtually none of <sighs> no. The guys that are here are more conscientious. The average GVSEC slot racer seems to have a phobia about lubricating their cars. Um, guys, you have to lubricate. You have to lubricate your cars. And I'm not talking about gallons of, of, uh, of oil and grease, but you need to make sure that there's some lubrication in the right places. What oil do you use? Any light grade, like sewing machine oil, like, um, three in one or whatever. I don't even know if you get three in one in North America, but a light grade oil. I use a uh, super lube. Uh, it, you can get it from, from slot car vendors. It's a nice thin, it, it's supposed to have PTFE in it. Um, whether that's important, I very much doubt. All you just want is a light grade oil. The question then is, where do you lubricate? The obvious things. You lubricate, and I'm not going to stick the bottle of oil upside down. You have to add oil to the bushings. A drop or two. So typically what I would do is, bam, it's hard for you to see. Uh, okay. I just 
squeeze it until a drop comes out and you place it in the bushing. For the first time around, maybe you add a little more than just a drop. No more, because otherwise you'll end up with oil all over the bloody show. Perry, you noticed that last year at, uh, at Edmonton at the TT, before you could put your car in the track for the, on the race day, they put a piece of paper towel on the track and lifted the rear end and ran, just revved the car to, to throw off any oil or, or grease that, that's on the gears and, and, the, uh, and the bushings because people do over oil a bit. The other one is, so you're okay for oil on the back bushings. The next one is on the front is same thing where the friction points are. So drop of oil, drop and a half of oil there. I also stick a drop of oil above the, the set screw, you know, the, the set screw from the bottom. Or if you don't have set screws, the cap. So a drop of oil there and a drop of oil there. They say you should oil your motor on very rare occasions. I'm I tend to be paranoid about that because I've had too many uh, slotted motors have issues with, with gunk on the commutator. Where does it come from? The brush is wearing plus oil coming from the, the, uh, the bushings. But if you do oil it, you have to oil the, uh, this front bushing over here. One drop every year. and really a teensy tiny little bit of oil once every many hours of running and the same uh, at the back you see it? yeah just where the shaft comes out i'm not going to stick any oil in there and just make sure that the oil gets worked through remember guys your front axle should be running nice and freely. If you spin it, it's got to keep on turning for a little while and you've got to make sure that there's no binding on the back axle. The other thing that you have to do, especially important on slotted inlines, is grease. Again, I use, geez, the light is terrible. Super lube synthetic grease with PTFE. What you have to do is put some grease in the groove. This is one of the highest friction areas in your whole slotted slot car because the shaft has to absorb all the lateral forces when your car go around the corner. And it is on a thin, as the, the, the motor shaft, that thin contact patch against the, the, uh, the, the bushing, you know, the hub of the gear. You have to grease that regularly. Oil is not good enough there. It tends to fling off within seconds. Um, you can also put a little bit of, of grease on the on the uh, the teeth, so you just add a little bit of grease between the, the pinion and the and the spur gear. So you you add a little bit of grease, you turn it, you add a little bit of grease. So you just make sure that there's a, a very light amount of grease right around on the on the teeth of the pinion and the crown gear. Um, is it important? Do I, will I lose sleep about grease on the, the, the teeth of the gear? Not so much. Will I lose sleep about no grease on the, the, um, the hub and the, where the, the axle, the shaft runs, motor shaft runs? Yes, that I will lose sleep over. That is very important. 
everybody have oil and grease? Nod and say yes, even if you're lying through your teeth. Yes. Yes. Right. Good. Okay. So now you basically have the chassis set up, ready to run. And uh, Larry, you were asking about, do I run my cars ahead of time on the track or anything like that? Uh, typically what I do when the car gets here, everything that we've gone through in these workshops, I do to the car before I ever take it to the track. It's a little bit silly because it, it's perhaps nice to get a baseline as to what the car is like without anything done to it, but I really couldn't be bothered. So uh, I will just benchmark it against similar cars. So I typically do all of the stuff that we've been talking about before the car even gets to the track. Except for flattening the chassis. Sorry? Except for flattening the chassis. Well, if I have to flatten the chassis, I flatten the chassis. If it's a no, I know, but I mean, the only way you're going to find out if, the, if you need to flatten the chassis is to take the wheels and everything off. And you were saying that on scalies, you don't bother doing that. Yeah, but I was talking about slotted now. So okay. let's, let's slotted not slotted confuse, yeah. confuse that because I, as I said, I've not flattened any scale electric or Ninko or any other of the, the you know, simpler brands. Um, how about the scale auto or uh, the um, flies? The simpler bands like flies, I don't bother with chassis flattening. Mm -hmm. um, but scale auto is similar to NSR and, and slotted. They're sophisticated cars. And yes, my current scale auto proxy car, I had to flatten the chassis. Okay. All righty. So we go back to mounting the body and then how much float. So the simple thing is oh, somebody just had an accident. Uh, I just lost one that little washer. How important do you guys think these little washers are on the slotted body screws? On the screw, Alan. Sorry? The Your other washer is on the screw. How important is it to have it on the screw before you put the car together? You said you lost one. I found it. Yeah, I can see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I am not convinced it is necessary or it is even good to have the washer on the body screw. But it comes with a, with a washer. Why, uh, Alwyn? I'm not sure if it serves any purpose, really. You know, typically because you're... Uh, a washer is normally helps when you're tightening a bolt like heavily. With this, you're going to have some play. So what purpose is the washer going to, to serve? Because again, what you'll be doing, you'll be getting the same way that you have chassis float, you're gonna have body float here. So the same, the same concept. Um, You'll tighten it down and you'll back it off like a turn. And in fact, what? Does that go for the uh, motor mount then too? Uh, yes, there are washers on there. I, yeah. I've got washers on my motor mount, but I don't have any washers on my body. My body screws are tapered. Yeah, I, on the pod, I tend to leave the washers in on the screws. Yep. On the body, I typically, I'm not too concerned one way or the other. Oh, mine never have uh, washers on them. They're tapered screws that go into my body. 
Uh, you mean your slot car body? Yeah. They're, they're tapered heads on the on the um, from the bottom end, right? You yeah. Mean the countersunk head, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's tapered. Yeah, it's got a yeah, an angle to it to the head. That's what's known as countersunk. Countersunk. Now, interestingly enough. It seems that I did not open up the holes on this car yet. You know, when we did the chassis, we said that you should gently open up the, the screw holes for the, for the body mounting. I've not done it. So, but what you would typically do is tighten it down and loosen it somewhere between a half and one turn, both of them. Make it one turn. So you'll end up with um, the body, the chassis being able to move something like this. It should not be tight. It should not be hanging up. The front of my car is now hanging up because I didn't prepare it properly. But yeah, you can see uh, what you're looking for is, is that kind of amount of movement. And it must move freely without jamming or, or hanging up. So easiest is make sure that everything is loose and clear, tighten it down, back it off one turn, that's your starting position. Why do we do it? There are apparently two principal reasons. The one is you want to isolate the, the chassis from the, the body so that the vibrations, you get some vibration isolation. The other one is as you go around the corner, what happens is that um, it, it, the body tips to the outside and the little bit of extra weight transference to the outside is supposed to give you better grip on the on on the back tires. Is the theory sound? I'm not so sure. Does it work in the in practice? You bet your ass. It is very important. The other thing that we we spoke about briefly last week is the amount of how wide, how far out do you put the, the wheels? Um, you put them out as far as possible without them catching or binding in any way, shape or form. And when I say catching or binding, I mean you have to move the body relative to the chassis the way that it would move when you're, you're running the car. And at the extremes of the movement, the tires must still not touch the body. Guys, um, front tires, for instance, touching the body is a killer in terms of handling. Because I think I mentioned it last week, if you're going around the corner and the, the front tire touches the body, immediately the, your front axle slows down and it throws your car. Because remember, we're at the speeds we're racing, the cars are on the bloody edge. If it touches like that, you are off. I mean, it is almost guaranteed inevitable. So on the back, you would do the, the, the same thing to, uh, to make sure that it sits just barely inside the body. And that if you rock the pod, and the uh, the chassis that in in the worst case it doesn't touch anywhere and remember you have to take a look at not just touching the fender you have to take a look at most of these cars um, on the back the body drops in on the inside of the tire so that when when the the body rocks and the pod goes up it can actually rub on the inside of the body, not just the fender, the, the outside lip of the fender. 
So you have to take a look at, at both of those. So you have to make sure that you get your wheels positioned so that they're inside the body and that they don't rub anywhere. Make sense? Yep. This is one of the most important handling tips and, and performance tips. It's such a small thing, but it can be such a pain in the ass. I mean, problem. Okay, so we've taken a look at the float, how much? We've taken a look at the pod, the chassis. Uh, no, we haven't looked at that. Guys, what you also have to make sure is um, it's normally not a problem with, with good Group C cars, good slotted cars. But you have to, when I said you have to make sure that there's free movement, if you've changed anything on the car, you have to make sure that the motor isn't binding on, on the interior. On some of these, this is very important on things like scalies or whatever when you, you're trying to, to get some body float on them. Um, because the inside, the, the uh, clearances inside is like nothing. So frequently when you're on any car, when you do the, the body float, you'll have to make sure that when you put the, the chassis in the body, that it sits flat. In other words, without the screws, the, the chassis sits flat on the body posts, that it's not something is sticking up. There's a wire in the wrong place. There's the lead on top of the motor is standing up and it's jamming into the interior. You have to take a look at all of those to make sure that, it, that it's not binding and, and causing, causing problems there. Are you with me? It's especially <laughs> if you're changing it, putting in a different pod or a different motor or with, a, with uh, lesser brands, you know, the, the, the toy brands, if I can call them that, like Scaly and, uh, and Carrera and Fly. Um, typically NSR, Scale Auto, Slotted, you normally wouldn't find interference like that, except slotted when they brought out their Ferrari F40, there was massive interference between the motor and the, and the interior and even the gear. So you had to grind away half the bloody interior to, to get rid of that. So they're not immune to it, but I don't think there are any, none of the modern Group C cars have that problem. But just in case, you know, it might just be that the interior isn't seated properly inside the body and it's sitting a bit lower make sure that there's no interference there. Okay, so we're pretty much done with these. And this is the secret I, I thought I would rather not tell you about this one because this is my winning secret source. Actually, I just screwed up the editing, but never mind. The last few things, make sure, because now what you're doing is, this is the last look at the car before you take it to the track. So you need to make sure that the braids are sitting, you know, perfectly flat against the guide. When you put it on the, on the block, that it, it doesn't spring up You've got to make sure that the, the car sits um, not like that. Okay, there's a, it's hard to see. It shouldn't sit like that. The, take a look to make sure that the car sits flat. And if you have to tweak pod screws a fraction to have them a little off, you might have to do that, but normally that shouldn't be necessary. Okay, now the screw has come undone. So what you're looking for is to see that the car sits, the body, the chassis, everything sits perfectly flat. If it's not sitting flat, 
you'll have to go and back into the car and take a look at why is it? Because that means something is not perfectly flat. Something is, you know, something is binding, something is hanging up, something is not right. I can't give you an exhaustive list of the reasons why it might happen, but I can tell you it's important if the car, if you flatten the chassis, if you flatten the pod, if you've scraped it and it sits clearly in the pod in the chassis, if everything is set up correctly, if you've loosened the pod screws the correct, the same amount left and right, etc., cetera, um, the car should be sitting flat. If it's not sitting flat, it means that something's out of whack somewhere and you have to go and find out what it is and fix it. Am I going to be, a, you know, grossly upset if it's a, a tenth of a millimeter lower on the one side than the other? No. But if it's a millimeter or more lower, yeah, then there's something that, that you need to go and do about it. And what happens then is you go to the track and you start testing it and immediately you find that your new car is now faster than anything else that you've ever had and you go home and you have a, a beer or a glass of wine or a glass of champagne and you're happy and you beat the snot out of everybody else in, in the next races. And they all live happily ever after. <clears throat> Questions, comments? Great lessons, Alwyn. Thank you for uh, sharing all these with us. It, it's, it would have been nice. It's a pleasure, Tim, and it would have been nice if I could have said, do this and you, it would be perfect. Do this and it would be perfect. The problem is with a lot of these things you'll see, getting the last bit out of it is, is the fiddling part and fine-tuning yourself. But yes, this will give you a good car. Okay, I got a question, Owen. Yes, sir. With your, uh, when you're placing your lead in your car, I see it looks like you're using some of these tire weight. Um, do you just stick the thing in using that the tape on the weight, or do you use something else that's a little easier to remove the weight? Because if we're going to be playing with the uh, moving the weights around, they can be a real bear to get off. What do you use to stick the weights on? Um, I typically use some E6000. What's that? Oh, you missed, you missed those lessons. It's like, are you familiar with Shugu or? or yep. um, yeah, okay, Shugu. It, it's like Shugu, except it's, it's, it's made by the same company. Okay. Um, the eclectic company. It's a, a little bit more liquid. It's, it's, it's thinner, it runs better. And typically what I would do, Ross, with something like this, I would remove the, the self-adhesive crap uh, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, strip stuff. I would place it. I wouldn't put glue on the bottom of it and glue it in place. What I would do is add a little dollop over the edge here and the edge here okay. and, and one or so, so on the other side, because that way, if you want to remove it, you can easily take your, your uh, X-Acto and just cut that little thread of glue yeah. or just lever it up. But it's still so, it is, you know, it's under normal circumstances, that is more than good enough to make to ensure that it doesn't move or, or come out. I was hoping you'd have something a little easy because if you run this thing, say, 10 laps with it the way it is and you don't like it, you want to shift the weight and then you run it for another 10 laps and you don't like it and you want to shift the weight, it just becomes a, a horror show. I was hoping you would have something kind of simple for just gluing it in place. Like yeah, that. it's, uh, that is about the easiest one. That, yeah. But yes, at the track, what I've done is I've, I've used the self-adhesive part of, of uh, you know, the, the NSR weights that I showed you because they yeah. have thin, uh, I would never trust that to last for long but I would use that if I'm just testing short term quickly and I want to, to put a piece of weight in a different place. 
and then I would just make use of, of the self-adhesive thin backing. Um, because then if I want to remove it, I just lift it up with a fingernail and it's gone. But if then, if I say this, this actually works, then I can go and do the, the E6000 trick. Does the shoe glue dry any faster than the E6000? Uh, not that I've noticed. I used to use hot glue, Larry. That works pretty quick. No, that's what I usually use is a little bit of hot glue. I have a, a thing. I just have a, a phobia about uh, hot glue. I just hate the stuff. So I don't use it. But if it works for you, it works for you. I would never use hot glue, hot melt glue on the motor. You know, something that you want to make sure you glue in really well. I would never do it there. There, I would use something like E6000 or maybe shoe glue. Hey, Ross. Yeah. Whenever I have to do some weight testing, and so I, I did this, for example, when I was testing my Morgan last week. I have actually three small pieces of lead that I use for that. And they're, uh, they're sheet lead about a millimeter thick. And uh, two of them are identical. They're about uh, maybe eight or nine millimeters wide and about 15, 16 millimeters long. And then the other one is, uh, is closer to the size and shape of uh, Alwyn's wheel weights. It's a little rectangle. And on the back of those, I have uh, double stick carpet tape. But the trick is to go buy the crappy stuff from the dollar store because it sticks just well enough. And so you can peel those pieces of lead off and re-stick them many, many times. They don't stick super well, but they stick well enough to test your weight distribution. And what I do with those is I actually stick them on the bottom of the chassis uh, to do the weight testing. And then from that, I can learn where to position the weight and how much weight to add. And once I figure that out, I peel those back off open the chassis up and put a more permanent weight solution that mimics the, the position and amount of weight that I tested with those peel and sticks. Yeah, not a bad idea, but I've got some double-sided carpet tape and man, it sticks like crazy. That, uh, yeah, you gotta buy the, buy the junk. It cheap, cheap stuff, off. okay. <laughs> this, yeah. This is, some is, this is some uh, Professor Motor lid and it has this, as I mentioned, this really has the, the crappy stuff that you were talking about, Blair. It's enough to hold it in position temporarily while you're doing testing, but it's not sufficient to hold it permanently. So I just cut pieces of this and, and move them as required. So same, same principle. In the old days, we used to just take a little bit of plasticine, put it on the bottom of the weight, and then just push it down on it, and it would stay there for few laps and that and then to, to get your testing. I mean, Good idea, Larry. Yeah. The, the problem idea. is to, to get the same amount of weight as you would with lead because the specific gravity of, of, uh, of the, the plasticine or whatever you're using is, is way lower than lead, so you have to use a whole bunch of it. No, but what I, was, what I was saying is you could even use a little small piece of plasticine on the bottom of your lead oh. and attach it. Yeah. It'll, it'll attach to your to your plastic for a while to, to make, you know, if you say five laps or so, 10 laps or whatever you, you want it to turn around and uh, whoop. I, do. I'm not a, not a fan of that, but whatever floats your boat. <laughs> yep. Or, or, the, or there's the other thing. Uh, you can get a, uh, it's kind of like a, a gummy, well, it's like a gummy plaster seam a little bit, and they use it for sticking wires on. You buy it at the dollar store. For, sticky tack. Yeah, sticky tack type of stuff. I find it's just too thick. By the time you get yeah. it underneath the lead, now it's dragging on the track. Yeah, that's a kind of a drag. Okay. It is a drag. Just apply. Masking tape can help. <laughs> I use masking tape temporary solution. Yeah. yeah, inside the chassis, that's fine, but it's also a problem, as, uh, as Blair was saying, if you stick it on the bottom of the chassis, because it adds another half a millimeter. Yeah. Okay. 
you know, for some of my scaly cars, I've actually got some lead on the bottom of the chassis. But if you're participating in a in a serious series, um, most of the the proxy, no, all of the proxies will say uh, no weight is uh, allowed to be visible from you know on the outside of the of the chassis. But I find it on like scaly NASCARs, nice to have a thin strip of lead at the on the bottom of the chassis. But then it has to glue, be glued on bloody well. Gentlemen, that's all I got. Thank you. Perfect Good timing, because I got to run. Elwin, excellent job as always. It's my pleasure. And uh, by tomorrow evening, I should have this up on YouTube and I'll send you guys the link again. Hey, that's great. Thank Thanks you very much. Guys. Thank well, you. Guys. Good to see you all. Yes, sir. Have you ever used that Jerry RPM checker app? Yes, I, I have used it, but I I'm not a I don't have much of a hang ups on motor RPMs. Will it will it measure uh, like your RPM on your uh, on your back axles at all or not? Don't know. I've only measured motors. Okay, gentlemen. Have hey, a thank, you. Good thank you, Owen. Have a good thank day. you very much, Owen. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you Bye. some of you Friday. Yeah. Yep. See you guys. Bye. Yeah, Friday. See you. Bye. Peace out.